Anybody have any sort of questions that they had from last time or anything? Actually, be f if we can start a little early. Um, the, uh, as I, as I uh, mentioned, nobody's had trouble getting into the Wolfram folder, right? Okay, and the PDF of the law and economics is there. Um, but I had a couple students from last year that left their books and wanted to know if anybody wanted to buy a hard copy. Um, so anybody, you, you don't have to decide right today, but by, by Monday, you might want to think through um, if you'd like to buy a used copy. And we'll have their reservation price, which I know, but I'm not going to tell you what the reservation price is. Um, so what we'll do next time, if you're, uh, you know, if you want to, in fact, instead of doing it live, why don't we do this? Why don't you email me if they're interested in buying a used copy, okay? And they're, um, you know, they've got some some marks and stuff in them, but they're, you know, they're, but. You know, all the pages are here. Um, so uh, anyway, if you're interested in having a, if, if you sort of feel better having a hard copy in your hands, um, why don't you send me an email and say, hey, I'm willing to bid X amount of dollars for a hard copy. And uh, let me know. And then on Monday, uh, we'll go ahead and if, if, if they've met the reservation price, then I'll award them to the highest bidder for, uh, for the used copy, all right? All right, I mean, they're, they're in reasonably good condition, you know, they're, so. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and take roll this time. Because um, we're in, okay, so uh, Danielle. Sort of interesting because you, uh, you guys are supposed to be wearing your masks, okay? So I'm like in the age group where, what do they call that? You're, I don't know, you're in that age group where you could get it. In fact, I'm probably older than most of your parents, to tell you the truth. Um, in fact, one time on Parents Weekend, I had the, the parents come in, and I'm meeting with the parent, and da da da. da we're talking, and then the one goes, um, "Well, gee, um, I uh, I know that uh, they're really going to enjoy your class because I had you as a professor." <laughs> so anyway, okay. So uh, Daniel uh, uh, Daniel Berg, so I'm come in, okay. Uh, Joy, um, Tyler, uh, Therese ends. And is that is it Therese or Teresa? Therese? Uh, I actually go by Tess. By Tess, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Sabrina. Got, okay, and is that Sabrina? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew Giovanetti. All right. Uh, Michael Hagestad. Uh, Joseph. Um, Kaisa. Uh, Josiah, uh, Nathaniel Jones, is here? Okay. Um, uh, okay, I've had you in Econ 105. Lu Lucia? Lucia, if you want to call me Lucy, that works. Okay. Uh, okay, Robert Lowry, uh, Conrad, uh, Isabella. Melody McDonald, uh, Emma, uh, Micah Perry, Alexander Reed, uh, Ethan, uh, Jack Shelley, Jack, okay, came in, uh, Parker, and we got left here, um, Ryan Thompson, make it, he was, I know he was, Oops, sick. Okay, uh, Grace, 
uh, Stephanie Walker and um, Aiden. All right. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit late, um, the uh, if you're interested in buying a uh, used copy of Law and Economics from Ingrid de Groot and another person from last year, um, give me send me an email with your bid price and if they meet their reservation price, then I'll let you know and you can pick them up on Monday, okay? Um, it is Friday, uh, which means classic album of the week, okay? So you guys, if you had me in class, I think almost 20 of you had me before. So anyway, classic album of the week this week is, anybody know this? This is Bob Dylan and the band. Okay, 1974, live album. Um, how many have heard of the band? Are you kidding? That's all? Three of you heard of the band? Oh, okay. All right. You gotta watch the documentary called The Last Waltz. Okay, so you guys know how to get on Netflix or whatever it is. Um, watch the documentary The Last Waltz, which is the band's last tour. Anyway, they did the backup for Dylan um, on um, Highway 61 Revisited, where he went from folk to rock, and it was a big thing. Anyway, um, and all this light here is they're in the dark, and they're holding up not their cell phone with lights on it. They're holding up matches, okay? So that's what all this is. So 1974, Bob Dylan and the band recorded live uh, Go ahead and you know get get on uh, a Spotify or something and take a listen to uh, to that one. All right. Um, so last time uh, we were talking about um, you know the laws being the rules of the game, and we talked a little bit about how if you have uh, uh, you know like if you have a minimum wage, then that'll change how people's behavior is and want to in in for economists they're um, uh, their addition to law and economics is that you can sort of figure out, hey, if we make the law this, this is what's going to happen. Um, and uh, I did mention a tax on consumers last time, um, and I was just going quickly over because um, all I wanted to say was that if we have a tax on consumers, it's going to affect what the market price is and how many people buy it, etc. And uh, and then I did a, just a quick thing on the, uh, what happens if it's on the, on the consumer or what happens if it's on the supplier. And for those of you who had Econ 402, which is three of you, um, you notice that it doesn't matter the end price turns out being the same, but the, and the, output, the, the output ends up being the same and the price will just be different. So if you, uh, uh, you know, I went and I was, when I did it on the supplier, I just quickly did this thing and, uh, uh, and Joy, Micah, and Jack all came up to me after class and said, uh, hey, you know what, um, you didn't quite do that very clearly, looking back at my 402 notes. Not really. But uh, I just thought, okay, let's, let's just do that a little more clearly. And so just to give you an idea, um, and again, we go over this in more, much more detail in Econ 402, but the way economists would look at that is to say, what is the supply curve, right? You know from Econ 202, that's the marginal cost curve, right? And this was what? This is the marginal benefit curve. And if what we do is the supplier has to pay the tax, which is the case in the state of Michigan, we mentioned, you know, the, the, in the state of Michigan, the sales tax is a tax on the person making retail sales in Michigan. So you don't really have the burden of the tax. It just allows the, the uh, retailer to mark the price as the price minus the tax. But it's, you know, sometimes you see ads, we pay your sales tax. They always pay your sales tax, okay, because it's not your sales tax. The tax is on, on the actual retailer. Um, but anyway, so what would happen is the marginal cost is now going to be whatever their marginal cost of production is, plus what? Plus the tax, right? So what would happen is 
this would be the marginal cost plus the tax. Okay, so, uh, so what, would what would happen here is that we'd end up there, right? That's the amount to be produced. This would be, um, uh, this would be the, the price, and then that would be the tax. So at the end, what do you end up when you go to the grocery store? The price will be higher by the amount. Now it's again because of the way they do it in Michigan. There's a that allows them to not do that. But realistically, uh, what will happen is if the if the tax is on the uh, on the producer, what will happen? The price will rise, but it won't rise by the amount of the tax unless that demand curve was straight up and down. Okay, so not going to ask you to do that until you get the EM402 but I just wanted to be a little bit clear that if you put a tax on uh, a good, if you have a law that puts a tax on a good, it'll affect what the market price is and it'll affect how much uh, people are buying and how much people are producing. So that's the point that we're, we're trying to make there. Again, um, Affordable Care Act, 2,700 pages of the, of the law itself, uh, 27,000 pages of regulations, Right? So there's all sorts of behavior that occurs because you've passed this law. And as an economist, using law and economics, you say, okay, here's what the law is. Let's try to figure out what the, what the, end, what the end is on that. Um, again, renewable energy. I mean, there's all sorts that you can think about. Um, does, uh, if we have renewable energy requirements, which we do, and let's say the state of California has much stronger renewable energy requirements than a lot of other states, might that lead to um, rolling blackouts? Uh, you know, could you know could that happen? Well, what you know what would cause that? So, as an economist, you'd be sitting around thinking about that. So, uh, and then uh, last time that we uh, we were you know finished up with uh, this idea of. Um, Coase's famous paper, uh, The Problem of Social Costs in 1960. Uh, and again, there's a footnote. I noted uh, the footnote uh, number, uh, footnote two in chapter one here talks about uh, Coase's paper. And that's you know when economists are now starting to get into uh, the analysis of the, of the law. So this, if this were 1950, you guys would just be learning case studies, right? I mean, there wouldn't be a class in law and economics. You'd be learning, at, okay, this is what the law is, okay? So, but what we're gonna do is, this is what the law is, what the law ought to be if you want to accomplish something. And if you make the law this, then all these other things will start to happen. So, um, it also changes the framework of the debate, if you sort of think about it. Um, let's say we're gonna talk uh, about the death penalty, right? Well, uh, if you're an economist, one way to think about the death penalty is, okay, what does that do to people's behavior if you go out and you, imp you have the death penalty for, uh, as a punishment for a crime, okay? Um, imagine if you had uh, a death penalty for littering, okay? Um, well, that would, prob that, would that reduce the amount of littering? Well, it might, but then you sort of think about it, but maybe if I'm on a jury, Maybe I might want to say, oh, you know, I know Micah really threw that out, but uh, do we really have to execute him for doing that, right? So, um, well, you know, it, it changes that perhaps it changes the framework of the debate. Like, if we're going to talk about the death penalty, the way an economist would start to look at that is, okay, um, what what does that do to people's behavior? What does that do to the probability of uh, of being uh, of of um, being actually convicted? Um, and uh, what if people, what if we find that, um, if we're looking at behavioral economics and we find that most murder cases aren't because somebody thought about it first and decided, mm, okay, I know that there's uh, you know, a chance I'm gonna get executed or whatever if I kill this person. Maybe they just whip out their gun and shoot them, all right? So maybe they're not, maybe we find out that, um, if we start using behavioral economics, we maybe find out that people don't uh, spend as much time making uh, this calculation prior to the event, right? Uh, so that's, again, you might use some behavioral economics to talk about that. So one of the, one of the concepts that we look at is, particularly with, uh, well, with 
whether you want to sue somebody or whether you're going to commit a crime is to look at this idea of expected value. And again, um, if you've had Econ uh, 303, I presume they talked about expected value. Um, in 415, we'll talk about it. But expected value, what is that? Well, that's the probability of the event occurring times the value, right? Or if we look at expected cost, right, times the cost of it. So you guys are totally bummed because the most popular fair on earth, the Hillsdale County Fair, which is in October, and if you've driven by the fairgrounds, uh, they, they actually redid the grandstands, and, but they did put back up most popular fair on earth, they put it back on the grandstands. Um, so in October, uh, normally people, everybody would be going to the Hillsdale County Fair and et cetera. And one of the, let's say you go to the fair and there's a game, and what the game is, is that you pay to play this game, and what they do is you flip a coin. Okay, and you get, um, you get a dollar, if it comes up heads, and you get zero if it comes up tails, okay? So now the question is, what would you pay to play that game, right? So if you're sort of thinking about it, you say, oh, well, I got to look at what's the expected value, right? What's the net expected value of this thing? Well, half the time it's going to come up heads, right? So the probability, if it's a fair coin, Half the times it's going to come up heads, and I'm going to get a dollar. But half the, come up, half the time it's going to come up tails, and I'm going to get um, uh, minus, uh, I'm, I'm going to get zero, right? I get zero if it comes up tails. So that tells you that the fair price for the game then, fair price to play that game, is going to be one half times a dollar plus one half times zero and 50 cents. Okay? So if you were, had taken lawn economics, um, you'd walk up there and if they're charging you 50 cents to play the game, then you know, okay, on average, I'm going to come out even, right? I'm going to, half the time I'm going to win a dollar and half the time I'm going to, I'm not going to uh, get anything. So 50 cents is, a, is the uh, expected uh, value of the thing. So whenever we are looking at, for example, just a, a head, if you are looking at whether you're going to sue me, okay, you're going to have to pay an attorney, right, to uh, you know, to represent you, right? And then, so you got to figure out, okay, that's, that's my cost of getting into the, um, uh, getting in, in, into the, uh, uh, the suit. I got to figure out what's the, what's the expected value of that, right? If there's a 50% chance that I'm going to win and I'm going to win X amount of dollars, and if uh, there's a 50% chance, 50 chance I'm going to lose and I'm not going to get anything, um, then you'd be like this flipping the coin, right? So uh, whenever you go and you look for um, uh, you know, a decision about whether we're going to sue somebody or, again, if I'm going to commit a crime, I got to look and say, okay, what's the probability that I'm going to get arrested, that I'm going to get uh, uh, convicted, uh, and what my penalty is going to be, um, and then what's the, what's the benefit from my committing the crime, right? So I want to create a law that will make it so that it deters you from uh, committing crimes. We have a sort of a cost of, to people of committing crimes. And so you want to sort of, you want to uh, uh, think through that. Um, there's a famous paper, uh, or uh, um, uh, a famous paper that Gary Becker, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize, um, how many have heard of Gary Becker? See a few of you. Okay, yeah. So he won the Nobel Prize in economics, and um, so in 1968, uh, Becker wrote a famous paper 
um, uh, called uh, Crime and Punishment, uh, an Economic Approach, uh, and it's in the Journal of Political Economy. So if you go, if you want to take a look at that, uh, you can um, uh, get on JSTOR or whatever uh, and just look for Gary Becker. Uh, again, it's called Crime and Punishment, an Economic Approach uh, in the Journal of P uh, Political Economy from 1968. All right. Now, lots of you had Econ 105, right? And uh, we talked about Bastiat's The Law. And uh, near the end of The Law, what does he say? He says, you have to develop a science of economics before you can develop a science of politics. Right? Um, my favorite part of the book, try and bring it up to all our politics people, um, uh, you know, Mickey Craig and the like, and say, so what, so what is Bastiat talking about? He's, he's, when, when he says the science of politics, he's really talking about the law, right? The name of the book is The Law, right? So what he's really saying, uh, Bastiat's uh, uh, really saying is uh, you need to develop a science of economics before you start thinking about what the law should look like, right? Which is basically what this class is about, right? It's trying to integrate. You guys have all had at least Econ 202. Uh, uh, how many have had Econ 303? A bunch of you had 303, okay. Um, so you've, you've developed a basic understanding of economics, and so it's just, okay, let's apply that to the, um, uh, apply this to, to the law itself. Now, th think a little bit about that. Um, sometimes politicians will have a law, will create a law to favor certain groups. Okay, um, just uh, as an example, um, minimum wage, and we'll talk about that again several times, but let's think about that. What might happen, though, is that you have the unintended consequence of actually harming them. Right? These same groups that you think that you're favoring, it's actually going to harm them. And why is that? Because the average person doesn't have enough economics to understand, oh, if you do this, it's not, that's not all that's going to happen, right? People are going to change their behavior. Once you make the law this way, people are going to alter their behavior. And so that's going to end up with all these other things happening. And you need to think through how that's going to work. So, you know, I told this in, uh, in Econ 105 before, but um, a friend of mine that I went, uh, got my PhD with at Berkeley back, maybe back before your parents were born, but anyway, um, but I got my PhD, a guy named Hal Varian, right? And he, he became um, the uh, chief economist for Google and, uh, you know, probably is a gazillionaire by now because he started uh, advising Google when it was first starting and et cetera. Anyway, so Hal was giving a talk at the University of Michigan and my youngest, younger son was uh, going to school there. And so what I did was I went up, Hal was giving a talk there, went to his talk, talked to him for a bit. And then while I was waiting for my son to get out of class, there was a big rally going on, right? And what it was, was, uh, Tim Kaine was running for vice president, um, and uh, there was a big rally, a couple thousand people there. It's back pre-COVID, people could do that. A couple thousand people there, um, and what he did is he came up and he said, I want to make it, uh, you know, uh, I want to make it against the law for anyone who cannot make $15 an hour worth of product, I want to make it against the law for them to work in America. And everybody's going, yeah, that's great. I'm all for that, right? Now, that's not exactly what he said. What did he say? Exactly. If he wants to establish a $15 minimum wage. Now, it's saying the exact same thing. 
right? Because if you can only produce $10 an hour worth of product, how can I pay you 15, right? I'll go out of business, right? You, you, don't, you don't get to lose money on, on every unit and make it up in volume, okay? It doesn't work that way, right? If you go out and start your own business, guess what you're gonna find? If you pay $500 in wages and all you get out of that is an extra $400 in sales, guess what? You're going away, right? So, that $15 an hour minimum wage, who does that benefit, right? It benefits the people who are productive, right? And again, if we drew the, um, if we draw a wage here and we have a demand for labor here and we have supply labor here and we have some equilibrium, right? And let's say it's $10. And if I make the wage 15, what's gonna happen? The amount of labor that's demanded will be there and the amount of labor that's supplied will be there. And here's the equilibrium that we had before. These people will all gain more because they were getting $10 an hour now these people still will be now getting 15. And these people, they, they lose. And we know who these people are, right? Those are the low skilled. And that's often the time that the people that are for this, uh, you know, for the minimum wage, they don't understand they're the ones that are gonna get eliminated. And so as a, um, as a politician, I'll be for a $15 an hour minimum wage, even if I know that it's not gonna help the people that I, that think they're gonna get helped. The average person needs to, you need to explain to the average person, oh my gosh, I know you think you're helping these people, but the law really is gonna harm them, right? Um, and we'll talk more about this, but equal pay for equal work, right? So we pass a law, says women and men, equal, equal work, equal pay, okay? Now, all sorts of things you might think about. How do I know that it's equal work, right? Um, but suppose you could do that. What if I want to discriminate against women, right? I just don't want to have women working. Um, that I, I tell you about, I used to fight fire for the state of California. i tell you that, no. Okay, well, I fought fire for the state of California for six fire seasons back when I was in college and first part of graduate school. Um, and uh, so, and uh, the, um, the, the federal forest service, they allowed women to be firefighters, um, but the state didn't, okay? So I was thinking, well, gee, you know, I'm, I'm on this fire and I come back, it's my, you get two days off, get 48 hours off, I come back from the fire station, I'm going out on a date with this girl, and I start telling her how uh, great this, you know, how this uh, fire was so dangerous, and I was this out there, and et cetera, and she goes, oh yeah, my girlfriend was on that fire. Okay, didn't want to hear that, all right? So, let's say I, ha I want to discriminate against women, and I say, I don't want women, you know, working in this field or that field or whatever, okay? Now, Notice that there's a price discriminating. If women actually do equal work with men, right? A man and a woman are both producing $10 an hour worth of product, and I'm paying the man 10, and I'm only paying the woman eight, okay? Guess what? If, if, I, if, I am a, uh, if I'm discriminating, there's a price to me for discriminating, right? That's the $2 an hour. It's costing me $2 an hour not to hire the woman, right? So how can women overcome discrimination against them? They can overcome discrimination against them by what? By offering to work at a lower wage. And so what will happen? Those companies that are least discriminatory, they'll hire the women, and guess what? they're now paying $2 an hour uh, less than the companies that discriminate, and guess what? Competition, they'll drive them out of business, right? And so what, what you really think about is 
that if you make equal pay for equal work, What happens? You're making it so that you reduce the price of discriminating. Right? You reduce that price of discrimination. And when you reduce that price of discrimination, then what happens? You uh, will end up with more discrimination. So you might think, again, you might think you're helping women by making it equal pay for equal work. Even if you could solve the problem of how do I know when I've got equal, equal work, I'm actually reducing the price of discriminating, so you are making it so that women may more, be more uh, dis uh, uh, discriminating. But Conrad, you had a... Oh, yeah, you also reduce the cost of employment because you're both leaving liability. But if you hire a woman and she wants to sue you because she thinks that she's being paid better than she deserves, very good point. And if I'd have brought my Jolly Ranchers, I would have thrown them a Jolly Rancher. Start of the semester, I forget to bring everything, but um, I see some smiles from people that have had me before. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's a good point. Now, now I've got, well, I have to be sort of careful. Um, am I paying them the same? And what happens if they sue me? Then, hey, that could cost me a whole bunch of money. Um, and so I've got to have, you know, accountants that are out there ensuring that, uh, you know, that this work is equal, et cetera. All right. Um, so the, the point being is that um, uh, you, could, you could actually harm the people that you think that you're protecting if you haven't thought through the economics, uh, the economics of the whole thing. Um, so what can you use, again, economics for if we sort of just think about it for a minute, right? When we apply uh, economics to the law, uh, what we've just been talking about, right? We can predict the effect of the law. And, you know, in Econ 202, right, and 303, but in Econ uh, uh, 202, you just even that, that basic microeconomic theory, um, you can use it to do things like we just did, right? What you, you're gonna do, in Econ 202, you probably did minimum wage stuff in Econ 202, certainly would have done it in 303, uh, we do it in Econ 105, and so you can, you can predict, okay, if we make the law this, this is what's gonna happen. Um, for example, anything that you do to increase the price of labor, Right? If I have some law that increases the price of labor, which says, ah, you got to provide health insurance. All right? So let's say I were to pass a law that says that you have, to, you have to provide health insurance. Well, what did you just do? You just raised the price of labor. Right? The Affordable Care Act raised the price of labor. So if I, for example, if I raise the price of labor, okay? we'll call it Obamacare, okay? What's gonna happen? You're gonna substitute capital for labor, right? K is capital. I don't, again, I need 105 to talk about this. I have no idea why K is the substitute, unless it's capital must be, anybody German, is, is, is that how you spell? Okay, so that's probably it, right? Um, so anyway, uh, you're gonna substitute capital for labor. What does that mean? You're gonna, I, <laughs> it was like about five years ago, I told my students, uh, guess what? One day you're gonna walk into a McDonald's and um, you're just gonna walk up and there's uh, gonna be a, uh, uh, you know, something at your table or, when you, or a kiosk when you first walk in and you're gonna punch in uh, you know, what you want. And the, there's not gonna, you know, uh, and there's not going to be, uh, you know, people, there's not going to be as many people behind the counter because you will have punched it all in, right? Um, and of course, uh, one day there'll be little drones or something that'll come, you know, you go into a restaurant and there'll be little drones that come by and drop the stuff on your plate or something like that. So you won't have to interact with anybody. 
Seems like what we're trying to do in America is to make it so you never have to talk to anybody, right? We can just, just text them, right? Guess what? We had a thing that when you wanted to uh, interact with somebody, you didn't have to type anything in, you didn't have to do anything like that. You actually could talk to them and you would say something to them and they would re talk back to you, right? Uh, and it was called a telephone. Um, and uh, so you didn't have to worry about, oh, did I misspell that or da 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 da. Um, so anyway, that's my aside. Um, all right. So uh, anyway, you're going to substitute capital for labor. Uh, and so if I have the Affordable Care Act, when that passed, whoever was voting for it should have said, OK, I know what's going to happen in the long run. We're going to have a substitution of capital for labor. And maybe what I'll do is I'll substitute cheaper labor in some place, uh, you know, uh, let's say China, uh, and I'll substitute uh, that kind of labor for US labor. Um, so one of the, you know, they're you know, complaining about uh, how they've, uh, uh, you know, moved Again, you know, you're moving, cap capital's gonna move to where the low cost labor is if it's allowed to, all right? And so, uh, you know, if, if you had been uh, advising people on whether, the, you know, whether this law made sense or not, that would have been something to think about, that you, you'll end up raising the price of labor, increasing the price of la labor, will reduce, will reduce the amount of labor, you'll substitute capital for labor, you might substitute low wage labor if they're in other countries, it's, et cetera, so you think about that. Um, Another thing is you might explain how laws are made, right? And that's what we did in Econ 415, right? Talking about, you know, uh, why you would, uh, you know, special interest groups, why they would be in favor of this, this, this law or, or that law. Um, and what happens if you allow for uh, lobbying? Uh, do you have, if you, for example, um, in the state of Michigan, uh, if you are a, uh, a, a lobbyist, um, you have to, which means that you interacted to try to, you interacted to try to get legislation passed, then you have to fill out a form twice a year, which says, here's how much you spent on lobbying, um, and uh, a, a bunch of other things on the form. Um, and, so, uh, and, and, and you have to register as a lobbyist. So you have this whole legal framework about lobbying in the state of Michigan. And you, uh, uh, you have to, uh, you know, if you don't file the form, then there's rules about here's what's going to happen, et cetera. So uh, if you get on the um, uh, state of Michigan website, uh, you'll see, you, you'll see that you, uh, you, uh, if you go to uh, what's called LARA, L-A-R-A, uh, that's the department of, that deals with, uh, with this, um, or the Secretary of State, um, if you, you know, you'll see that there's all sorts of regulations about lobbying, and every state has it, um, and, uh, and so once, you know, we might explain in Econ 415, we might explain, okay, Here's why this happens, right? Because what do we talk about? We talk about rent seeking. If you take Econ 415, what Gordon Tullock calls rent seeking, which says that you will try to use the government to make a law that makes you better off, right? Uh, and so if you have a, uh, if we're going to have the Affordable Care Act, uh, and I am a, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Michigan Chiro well, let's, say I'm the, let's say I'm the National Chiropractic Association, right? Uh, and I'm the lobbyist for the National Chiropractic Association. What am I going to do? I'm trying to make it that when the law says that you have to provide health care for your employees, right? Health insurance for your employees, I want to make sure it covers chiropractic, right? And so uh, we can use economics, and we do an Econ 415 to talk about. Um, all the different uh, mechanisms that people use to try to affect the legislation, uh, how, why you might contribute to uh, folks that are uh, running for office, uh, et cetera. 
Um, and then uh, the third thing that we talk, we're going to talk about is uh, what types of laws they are, there are. And are they efficient or not? So we're going to talk about civil law and we're going to talk about common law. Right? And we'll talk in more detail about it. But basically, um, common law is law that develops because this is the precedent that's been set. Right? And we talked a little bit about this in Ecom 105. Um, uh, when you want, you want to be able to predict what the law is going to be, right? Hayek talks about this in the Constitutional Liberty. Um, so uh, if we set up our system where, and Hayek talks about this as the rule of law versus the rule of man, if you remember from Econ 105, right? So uh, common law is where the law develops because people are, uh, uh, you know, judges are, are saying, ah, this is what we did last time in this circumstance. Here's what we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing again so you get to understand what it is. Civil law is where we actually pass legislation, which we do in the, in, uh, the state of Michigan. And you have both kinds of laws in the United States. Some of it's common law that's set by precedent. Uh, uh, and so what are you gonna do? You're gonna read, you go to law school, you're gonna do, read case studies, right? And they're gonna say, okay, this is what we did in this case, you know, uh, Nestor versus state of California or something. Um, and, uh, and, but then we'll also look at, uh, uh, we'll also look at civil law, which is the actual legislation. House Bill 4152 or whatever, and that becomes, you know, Michigan law, you know, and you can look up the Michigan compiled laws and see what the law says. So we're going to look at both of that, but then we're also, you know, what to think about is that um, what, uh, what is the efficiency of this thing and what do we mean by efficient law? Um, do you want law to be efficient? Okay. So, So to think, think a little bit about what do we mean by efficiency. Um, again, in public finance, what did you, one of the things we did in public finance is we we'll look at, okay, if you make the law X, what will happen is people's behavior will change. And let's say you're trying to get, uh, raise a million dollars in revenue to fund the government, you know, the police, fire, whatever, okay, court system. So I'm going to try to raise a million dollars. I want to try to, if you want to be efficient, you want to do what? You want to make it so that you uh, disrupt people's behavior as little as possible. So if I were to have an income tax, what would happen? You guys might change how many hours that you work, right? Or uh, you guys might choose a different, uh, you know, a, a different profession, okay? Um, and uh, you, it might change, uh, uh, whether, you know, how many children you have, depending if you have depend, you know, dependents, and et cetera, however you frame the income tax. Okay? Now, if I make a tax that is what's called a poll tax, right? A poll tax is just a tax per person. We could, we could do this, we could say, guess what? We're gonna say everybody pays $100. Okay. Every year, you know, uh, we're trying to raise a million dollars. So, uh, what is that? Ten thousand people? Would that is that right? So, so if we had ten thousand people and everybody paid a hundred dollars, we'd get our million. And guess what? You can't change your behavior to do that, right? You're still a person, right? So, what is that? If you take public finance, that's going to be a very efficient law, right? Because I'm going to raise a million dollars and I'm not going to change people's behavior. I'll change their income. Right? We talk about an income and substitution effect of laws, but I'm gonna, everybody's going to have, their incomes will have changed because I need the revenue to go out and, and uh, hire police or whatever, but I haven't changed people's behavior, so it's really efficient. Well, um, there's a statue of a lady on campus um, who used to be prime minister uh, of Great Britain, right? Um, and she was the longest serving one, uh, and she ended up retiring in 1990, right? 
Anybody know who she is? Margaret yeah, Margaret Thatcher, right? She's got, got a, her statues out there. Anybody know why she retired? Guess what? She said, oh my gosh, I'm all for what? I'm all for a poll tax, right? Because it's really efficient. My economic advisor has been telling me about it. She was for a poll tax for a long time. So she gets a poll tax passed, and guess what? People didn't like it, right? They was efficient, but they thought, wow, this doesn't seem very fair. This person doesn't have uh, you know, very much money, um, and they're paying the same as this person over here that's like a gazillionaire, right? Uh, and so what happens then is that the, it be, was very unpopular. Um, and so she ended up uh, deciding, uh, it, it looked like the uh, Labor Party was going to win. Uh, and so she ended up resigning in 1990. Uh, and then the tax was repealed by uh, 1993, I think. Um, so uh, uh, it may be very efficient. It might, the law might be very efficient, but maybe we don't want it to be efficient. There's a trade-off here between what we think of, uh, we think of equity versus efficiency, right? It may be that you find a law that is equitable in some sense, but it's also efficient. But as an economist, you want to you want to know that okay, uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, yeah, you took, you know, I I, I took Econ 402. I can tell you, this is a very efficient way to do it. If I tax blind people, right, that would be very efficient, right? They can't change their behavior in order to avoid the tax, okay? Not gonna be real popular, right? So uh, uh, it may be that you don't want to have uh, an efficient tax. Maybe you wanna have something that is, uh, is less efficient, but is thought of as more equitable. Um, then let's think a little bit about what do we mean by efficiency? Okay, what do we mean by being uh, efficient, right? Um, well, uh, again, ECAM 415, uh, ECAM 402, we talk about it as well. Um, what we talk about is Vilfredo Pareto. Right. When we say something is Pareto efficient, um, wh what do we mean? We mean that you're at a state where, right, you can't make one person better off. Right? You can't make one person better off without making someone else worse off. Right? Without, making some, without making someone else worse off. Okay? So, I can't make one person better off without making someone else worse off. So you think about it for a minute and you go, okay, that makes it would be silly to not be at a Pareto optimal state, right? If you were at a non Pareto optimal state, what it would say? Say, you know, uh, I can make, uh, you know, I can make Joseph better off and nobody else worse off. Why would I not do that, right? So it doesn't make sense to be at a, at a non-Pareto optimal state. But what do we know, if you sort of think about it, there's going to be lots of them, right? Right? There's going to be lots of Pareto optimal states out there. I have everything, you have nothing. How do I make it so that you're better off? You've got to take something away from me, right? So that's a Pareto optimal state. You have everything, I have nothing. The only way to make me better off is to take something away from you, so that's a Pareto optimal state. So there's going to be lots of Pareto optimal states. And again, in NECAM 415, we do a lot of analysis on, on that. But the point being is that there's lots of Pareto optimal states, and how might we choose among them? Right? Um, and uh, so we, we might try to choose among them um, by deciding that there's some form of social welfare function, right? That it says, hey, 
what if, if, what if the people that get better off get better off more than the people that get worse off, right? And if we sort of thought about that, there was a guy named ben, uh, Jeremy Bentham, and what was that? That was utilitarianism, right? This idea of utilitarianism says uh, if the winners gain more than the losers, then you make that move, right? Do the winners gain more than losers? If the winners gain more than the losers, then you're going to adopt that. What we'll do for next time is we will uh, talk about um, is that a sensible way to do that and how might you do that and is it possible to do this and from 415, right? We're going to, looking ahead, what we're going to talk about, what arrows and possibility theorem, right? Uh, and so we'll just go ahead and do that and then uh, we'll start, we're looking through the, the uh, tools of uh, economic theory, um, marginal benefit, marginal cost, and game theory. So if you want to read ahead a little bit, go ahead and look at the, the next section on that, all right? Um, I may not be in office hours today. I might have to have a meeting, um, at least the office hours from one to two. If I'm in this afternoon, it's more likely to be two, two and later, all right? <laughs>